if you had to make a top 10 list of high school recruits to commit to Steve Sarkeesian at the 40 acres from 2021 until now, who would make your list and why? You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. On today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, we're discussing the top 10 high school recruits to commit to the University of Texas under Steve Sarkeesian, starting with Xavier Worthy in 2021 all the way to the 2024 class, the last class that is fully locked in and solidified at the 40 acres. And then in the last segment, that's going to be the first two segments. In the last segment, we are discussing the latest on Samaj Burrell being suspended indefinitely from the Texas football team in connection with the arrest and DWI charge that Tavondre Sweat received recently. All of that and more on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Now, I just want to let you know that this is my second time recording this this morning. Um, so if at times I see less seem less enthused or, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Less charismatic. <laughs> it's because I recorded this whole episode, thought it was a great episode, started uploading it, typing out the caption, you know, the YouTube description, the, the Canva thumbnail and all of that just to realize the video had no sound. Right. And I started to just go sit on the couch and say, you know what? I don't have time for this today and I'm just not going to put out an episode. But then I was like, I didn't put out an episode yesterday. I can't go ghost for two days in a row you know, in the middle of spring football and everything that's going on. So here I am recording this for the second time today. On Tuesday, I did an episode on uh, the transfer portal success that Steve Sarkeesian and his staff have had at the University of Texas, because there was an article written by 24 seven sports highlighting the top 14, not sure why it wasn't top 15, but highlighting the top 14 transfers uh, since 2022. And of those top 14 transfers, three of them had committed to the university of Texas. That's over 20%. The only other school that had three was Alabama, but it was manipulated a little bit because Caden Proctor was included in that number. And he's never played football anywhere other than the University of Texas. Like he's never even practiced at the University of Iowa. So, yeah, he entered the portal, but he's never played football anywhere but Alabama. Nonetheless, right, Steve Sarkeesian and his staff have not only done a good job of going into the portal and using it to fill holes on this roster, but they've gone out and got some of the best players the portal has had to offer, right, since it became a thing. And – on top of what they've been able to do in the portal, they've recruited so well in the high school ranks, setting the foundation of this football team through the high school recruiting. Right. Because coming off of a five and seven season, they've now brought in three straight top five recruiting classes out of the high school ranks. Right. And that's the biggest reason that Texas in three calendar years has gone from five and seven to legitimate or perennial national championship contender because of the elite level talent that Steve Sarkeesian and his staff have been able to bring on campus. So over the first two segments, my top 10 high school recruits that have committed to Steve Sarkeesian since he took over at the 40 acres. Since on Tuesday, I exclusively gave him credit for the transfer portal success. I want to highlight what he's been able to do in the recruiting ranks as well over the first two segments. And of course, the last segment, I'm talking about the Samaj Burrell, Tavondre Sweat situation. So number one on my list, I ranked the top 10 high school recruits to commit to Sark since 2021 at the 40 acres. This is obviously an opinionated exercise, so I can't say everybody should have the number one that I have, but I think it would be pretty consensus is Kelvin Banks. Going into the 2022 season, there were a lot of question marks at that left tackle position. Um, who was going to be, you know, our starter there? How productive, you know, would that player be? What would the quality of production look like? We expected to see a lot of growing pains at the left tackle position. And that was a very important position that year because that was Quinn Ewer's first time starting for real in college. Right. And so it's like, um, you know, we need to be able to protect his blind side and make life for him as easy as possible. Right. And even though you had a player in Kelvin Banks that could step into that role, you never want to have to throw a player that's a true freshman into that fire. But we had to. But we still didn't expect to see this level of play over the last two years from Kelvin Banks that we did. And we didn't expect to see it from day one. 
but we did, right? In two years at the 40 Acres, he has been second team all Big 12 and first team all Big 12. And I would expect this year in the SEC, he would be first team all SEC. His freshman year, he lined up against four first round picks at the edge position and Will McDonald, Will Anderson, Tyree Wilson and Felix Uzoma, who won Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year that year and more than held his own in all of those matchups. And in 2025, he should be a top 15 pick at least, right, probably a top 10 pick in the NFL draft as a left tackle. So, uh, you know, coming into the 2022 uh, season, left tackle was a huge question mark for us, huge. And from day one. Kelvin Banks has answered that question, right? And he's going to provide three years of dominant left tackle play at the University of Texas. He's going to be first or second team all conference every year that he played at the University of Texas. And he's going to be a top 10 to 15 draft pick in the NFL. I believe that Kelvin Banks is the best player thus far, based on what we've seen, to commit to Steve Sarkeesian at the 40 Acres since 2021. Number two, I have Xavier Worthy. Right. If you're able to go out and recruit the player that broke the record for the fastest 40 yard dash ever. And also in three years, he gives you two thousand eight hundred seventy nine yards from scrimmage coming from, uh, you know, passing, uh, rushing and receiving and 27 touchdowns in just 39 games at Texas. That's a superstar. Right. He also was an All-American punt returner at the University of Texas and seems like a lot to go in the first round in the 2024 NFL draft. Statistically and overall, Xavier Worthy is a top five receiver to ever play at the University of Texas and the first of a long line of NFL receivers to play under Sark at the 40 acres. Xavier Worthy was the first one. And Mitchell will be the second one, and there will be a lot more after that, right? But Xavier Worthy definitely set the blueprint in 2021 and was the only player that, you know, necessarily committed to Sark, right, for the first time in that class, right? Because everybody in that class had already committed to Tom Herman and decided to stay on. Xavier Worthy was the only player that he brought in in the 2021 class that was not already committed to Tom Herman and boy, did he get return on investment on Xavier worthy, you know, so glad he didn't go to Michigan. Cause like I said, arguably on the Mount Rushmore of receivers at the university of Texas, number three, Anthony Hill. I think this is where it gets interesting, right? I'm not sure you can make an argument for anybody over Kelvin Banks and Xavier worthy, but you know, like I said, this is where it gets interesting. Anthony Hill, number three, right? Even after one season, I think in his true freshman season at Texas, Anthony Hill won big 12 defensive freshman of the year, and was honorable mention all Big 12, along with multiple other freshman-related honors from various outlets. Hill played in all 14 games last season with six starts, totaling 66 tackles, eight tackles for loss, five sacks, and a forced fumble. Like, that's just a ridiculous stat line, period, right? And that was in a limited role, right, or a situational role at times until it just was unquestionable that he was one of the best defensive players in the country, and he started the back half uh, of the season, right? I'm basing him being number three on this list in terms of what he did this year, right? Um, you know, being a stalwart on one of the best defenses in the country and, you know, just really having this coming out party, especially in that Alabama game with two sacks and one of the biggest games, one of the biggest wins for Texas in the last two decades. I've already said that I believe he will win a SEC defensive player of the year at some point in his career. It's just a matter of when that actually happens, right? Whether it's this year or next year. And then I think he'll be a bona fide superstar in the National Football League. He reminds me so much of Roquan Smith in terms of having no weakness on the field and being that bona fide leader and galvanizer in the locker room. I think he's still growing into that role. But in terms of on the field, he's one of the best players in college football right now, bar none. He is a superstar at that linebacker position. He'll be a superstar in the NFL. And that's why I have him at number three in terms of Sark recruits since 2021. Number four, I have Jatavian Sanders, right? And this one is a little bit interesting because he originally committed to Tom Herman, as I mentioned earlier when I was talking about Xavier Worthy. The reason I give Steve Sarkeesian credit for Jatavian Sanders in the 2021 class compared to everybody else, you know, like Byron Murphy and Jonathan Brooks, players that played their best football under Steve Sarkeesian, is because I believe that JT Sanders or Jatavian Sanders had to reaffirm his commitment to Steve Sarkeesian, right? Coming in, there were question marks about whether JT Sanders would play edge or tight end. And he said, he's on record saying that once, you know, Steve Sarkeesian told him that he wanted him to play tight end, he knew he was staying at the University of Texas to play for Sark. If Sark told him he wanted him to play edge, does he stay at the University of Texas or does he transfer to another school to hopefully play tight end? So because we know that, I'm going to give Steve Sarkeesian credit because Jatavian Sanders had to reaffirm his commitment to Steve Sarkeesian, even though he originally committed 
to Tom Herman. The rest of the players in that class seemed like they were coming to the University of Texas regardless, right? On the Mount Rushmore of tight ends at the 40 acres and arguably the best pure talent at the position we've ever had, JT Sanders as a leader and playmaker changed the trajectory of this program. And if he would have played three years at Texas, he would own every tight end record at the 40 acres there is, and it would not be close. Remember, he was at the 40 acres for three years, but only played his sophomore and junior year. And in two seasons, he had 99 catches for 1,295 yards and seven touchdowns, which still puts him pretty much damn near in top three in every tight end metric at the University of Texas. To put in perspective how explosive JT Sanders was last year, he had more yards on less catches then Isaiah Bond, who was the number one wide receiver in the portal and one of the most explosive wide receivers in the country. Jatavian Sanders averaged more yards per reception as a tight end last year than Isaiah Bond, who was likely going to be our number one wide receiver this season. All right. That's insane. It shows you how productive Jatavian Sanders is, shows you how talented. Jatavian Sanders is and that's the reason that I have him number four on this list even though he originally committed to Tom Herman we don't know if Steve Sarkeesian told him to play edge if he would have stayed at the 40 acres or not but obviously he made the right decision to play tight end number five I have Arch Manning and this requires a bit of projecting but if Arch Manning even remotely lives up to his last name he will be number one on this list <laughs> the best high school recruit ever under Steve Sarkeesian and he may never move from that spot Right. Going on the better part of two years, we've heard nothing but rave reviews about Arch tangibly and intangibly right on the field in terms of who he is as a football player off the field in terms of who he is as a young man. Right. So much so that we still hear about him pushing Quinn, even though there is no competition. We know Quinn Ewers will be the starter this year. We know best case scenario for this football team is Quinn Ewers to be a star. But that doesn't mean there might be practices here and there where Arch Manning might look, you know, better than or close to comparable to Quinn Ewers, I should say. Also, when you look at it, his commitment undoubtedly put Texas in a position to get some of the best players in the country in the 2023 and 2024 classes. And whenever he starts, it'll be the Caitlin Clark effect, right? The highest rated games in the country will evolve Arch Manning, right? Like you'll have Ohio State, Michigan and some other games that will rate really highly. But when Arch Manning is a starter at Texas, when we look at the games at the end of the year, four out of the five or you maybe three out of the five highest rated games in college football will be the games that Arch Manning starts in. Because whether you're watching him because you're supporting him or you're watching him because you're rooting to see him fail, you will watch Arch Manning. So he's number five on this list and he's barely played. Once he lives up to that last name, he'll be number one on this list, bar none. A quick word from our sponsors and I get into six through ten of the best high school commits to Steve Sarkeesian since he arrived at the 40 acres. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the National Basketball Association and NHL. Baseball's in full swing and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right. So getting into number six on my list and number six on my list, I have Jaden Blue. Right. Last season, Jaden Blue reached the fastest top speed by a running back in college football and may be the fastest player at that position in the country period. We remember in high school, Jaden Blue at one point was the number one running back in the country before he didn't play his senior year. I think he dropped to like the 12th or 13th best running back in the country. I may be. I guess I would just need to look. I don't know if he dropped that far, but he definitely dropped from number one. And now we can see he's definitely not the 12th or 13th best running back in the country. I seem to be of the belief that he's probably the best running back on the team, although I have a ton of respect for Cedric Baxter. I'll talk about him here in a minute. Um, but, yeah, I just think Jaden Blue is an exceptional playmaker, and I think somebody whose best football is ahead of him. In 2023, or last season, Jaden Blue averaged 6.1 yards per carry on 65 attempts. To put that in perspective, the starter, Cedric Baxter, averaged 4.8 yards per carry. Jaden Blue behind him averaged 6.1 and 9.6 yards per catch on 14 receptions, with most of those coming behind the line of scrimmage, right? So 9.6 is still pretty impressive when you're catching the ball three, four yards behind the line of scrimmage. I think he'll be a dope Walker Award candidate this season. Yes, even as a backup or as running back too. And I think his best football will be played in the National Football League. He has only touched the ball 94 times at Texas thus far. So he is super fresh. And this year he's going to split opportunities with Cedric Baxter, Savion Red, and possibly even Trey Wisner. So I think Jaden Blue is just 
uh, an elite level football player. He has elite level explosiveness. And I think he's a threat to take it to the house every time you put the ball in his hands. I also think, you know, we've over or we've underestimated his ability to touch the ball 15 to 20 times a game, right? Like, I think we think that he's just some gadget or like some little scat back that we just give the ball eight times. He can go be explosive with it. No, I think you really could give Jaden Blue the ball 15 to 20 times a game and he could be one of the best players in the country. So I have him at number six. I think his best football will be played in the National Football League. I do think he'll have a really good season this year, but he's undoubtedly to me one of the most talented and best football recruits that Steve Sarkeesian has brought in out of high school since he arrived at Texas. Number seven, Colin Simmons, right? This is the first player that hasn't played a snap that is on this list, even though Arch Manning got it in garbage time in a 50 point game against Texas Tech. But when you look at Colin Simmons, in a way, you could argue that Colin Simmons had a similar effect on the 2024 class that Arch had on the 2023 class, right? Colin Simmons made the decision to commit pretty early, right? Especially for, uh, you know, a prospect of his caliber. And because he did that, there are a lot of players in this 2024 class that subsequently made the decision to commit to the 40 acres as well. Now there's some players in this class that we won't ever know for real, right? If they only committed because Colin Simmons came and if he didn't, maybe they go somewhere else. But I do think that when Colin Simmons, the crown jewel of this class committed to the university of Texas, then the domino started to fall after that. So I give him somewhat of an arch impact on this 2024 class, but you can make the argument that Colin Simmons might not even be here. If Arch Manning goes to a different school last year in 2023. I don't want to use the word generational and I've used it before with Colin Simmons. I'm kind of correcting now and like pushing back on that word because I've heard it too much. Right. Like every great you know player or player we think is going to be great can't be generational. Right. How long is even a generation? I think we need to answer that question first. He has the potential to be a once in a decade type of player. Right. I think it's fair to say he could be one of the best edge rushers we've had in the last 10 years and maybe the best defensive lineman we've had since we were winning championships at the 40 acres. Also, if Colin Simmons lives up to his billing, he'll be a lock to go in the first half of the first round whenever he declares because he plays one of the most important positions in football. So like Anthony Hill, I think he has a coming out party his freshman season. I think he has five to six sacks this year. I think he announces to the world that he's here this year. I think he has a breakout game this year where he absolutely just takes over and dominates. And you say, damn, right. That's why he won multiple state championships at Duncanville. And then I think sophomore and junior year, he'll make that leap to one of the best defenders in the country, period, bar none regardless of position. Number eight, I have Malik Muhammad. Last year as a true freshman at corner, he played in all 14 games. And according to the Texas sports website, he only had two starts, but I'm calling cap on that. Right? I feel like he was starting way more than two games, especially down the stretch, but nonetheless, right? He played in all 14 and I believe he made an impact in all 14. And he should be a starter for at least the next two seasons as well. And a high level starter at that, at the corner position. In his first season, Malik had 31 tackles, four pass deflections, one interception and a punt block touchdown in that Oklahoma game. And when Ryan Watts got hurt last year, he stepped up in a big way, ultimately taking a spot at the end of the season. And he was a great corner for us on the outside and should develop into one of the best in the nation by the time he leaves the 40 acres. And I think he's just a bona fide winner, right? Like, you know, he has said that he had won a, a championship at every level, every level of football he's been at. So hopefully he can get one, you know, at the University of Texas and then in the NFL. So that'll be true for the rest of his life. But the fact that he goes to South Oak Cliff, who I believe I'm not 100 percent on this, but I believe had never won a championship prior to that. And he wins two his junior and senior year when it's not a school that buys talent or just has crazy high end talent. Like he was the best player on that team. The fact that he created that type of legacy at South Oak Cliff, right? It's just, he's just a winner, right? Like, like some players are just winners. Some players just make winning plays. Some players just find themselves on really successful teams. And I think Malik Muhammad, that describes him to a T. And like I said, I think by the time he leaves the 40 acres, we'll be talking about him as one of the best corners in the country. If we're not talking about that from day one, starting with the Colorado State game this year, love Malik Muhammad's game, love Malik Muhammad's makeup. And I'm going to love watching Malik Muhammad for the next two years at the 40 Acres and then beyond in the National Football League. Number nine, the second player on this list that has not taken a snap yet at the 40 Acres, Ryan Wingo. It's hard to ignore everything you've heard about Ryan Wingo thus far or hear it and not expect it to translate. Right. From day one, we have heard about this early enrollee more than holding his own. Right. Don't overthink it. Just believe it. Right. Because we have a tendency to say, oh, well, it's just spring practices. Oh, well, it's just winter condition, right? We got to wait to see him on the field. And of course, right, you can have a strong off season um, and then go out and not perform, right? But based on everything we're hearing, based on the fact that Steve Sarkeesian mentions him in literally every <laughs> like spring press conference, you know what I mean? Like 
I think we should get the idea that we have a very special player on campus in Ryan Wingo, right? He's officially listed at 6'2", 210 pounds. He has posted speeds of 22 plus miles per hour in practice already, has been praised after almost every practice and scrimmage for making an impact, while the coaching staff has also highlighted his maturity, right? If this room wasn't so stacked, I think Ryan Wingo could have the type of impact that Xavier Worthy did in 2021. But when he gets his opportunity, you may say this is a stretch. I don't care. I'm standing on it. He'll put himself in the combo of one of the best to ever wear that jersey at the wide receiver position at the 40 acres based on everything we've heard this off season. Like I said, he's probably fifth or sixth on the depth chart right now, but I do think eventually he'll be the number one wide receiver at the university of Texas. And he'll be one of the best at that position to ever put on that Jersey. And then number 10, Cedric Baxter, I wanted to put Brandon Baker in this spot. Brandon Baker's honorable mention at number 11. I had to go with Cedric Baxter. I felt like I was getting a little too cute with the players that haven't took snaps yet at the 40 acres. And although I, Felt like Cedric Baxter left some meat on the bone last year, although I was expecting more from Cedric Baxter as a true freshman running back. He still had a very solid true freshman running back season. Right. You know, especially making that big jump and big transition from high school football and then making that lifestyle transition going from the state of Florida to the University of Texas in Austin, Texas. Right. I, in the past have made the mistake of writing off players, especially when we have, you know, this microwave society and these microwave opinions. Right. And so it's like, oh, he played 12 games and he didn't look like, you know, Ricky Williams, ah, <laughs> you know, like give Jaden Blue the starts. Right. And it's like in Steve Sarkeesian's offense with Tashar Choice's development, right, with the level of pedigree and talent that Cedric Baxter has, he can absolutely turn into that dominant force that we were expecting his freshman year over the next two years at the 40 acres. And like I said, even though he wasn't dominant last year, he still had a really productive freshman season. So, um, you know, he played in 12 games with six stars, ran for 659 yards on 4.8 yards per carry and five touchdowns while also posting 156 receiving yards. That is really good, right? Like I said, it's not what I was expecting, but it's still really good uh, from Cedric Baxter. And like I said, you know, I think over the next two years, he'll prove why he was the best running back in his class in the 2023 running back or 2023 recruiting class period. So um, definitely a huge opportunity over the next two years for Cedric Baxter uh, to make a name for himself at the 40 acres and then continue that in the National Football League. But right now, just based on talent, what he's done so far and what I expect him to do, I have him on my top 10 list of players to commit to Steve Sarkeesian at the 40 acres since he arrived in 2021. Quick word from our sponsors, and then we talk about Samaj Burrell, Tavondre Sweat, and an unfortunate situation for two Longhorns. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by Game Time, right? Priority, last minute deals. Save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, et cetera. Flash deals. Save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. Zone deals. Save even more when you choose a section and let game time choose the seats. All in pricing. Toggling this feature shows the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout. Seat views. You get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. The lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. You can make money on game time and game time ticket coverage. Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account and redeem code locked on college for $20 off. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Damn, I was kind of rolling on that uh, game time app. Hold on. I might have to go back and listen to that one. That one sounded good. All right. Talking about, um, you know, the, the Samaj Burrell and Savandre Sweat situation. Um, so basically we found out, I believe it was over the weekend, my, you know, time just flies, you know what I mean? So I believe it was over the weekend, but we found out that Tavondre Sweat was arrested and charged with a DWI, right? That's the first domino that dropped. The second domino that dropped was we found out that he was actually in a wreck, but that he was rear ended. Right. And that's why the police were on scene. The third domino that dropped in, you know, I'm not sure it's actually what order these came out because they both happened yesterday, but the third and fourth domino that dropped was that. Tavondre Sweat's alcohol limit was more than 25% over the legal alcohol limit. And he had also been tested over an hour after he was detained. So they believe that it could have, you know, it probably went down right in that hour, right? It could have been even higher. 
the fourth domino that dropped was that Samaj Burrell, right? Sophomore linebacker, or I guess you could say rich or freshman linebacker because he didn't play last year, um, was the driver of the other vehicle that rear-ended Tamandre Sweat. And instead of waiting for the police to arrive, he fled on foot, right? So it's just a, a bombshell that, you know, negatively and horribly affects two Longhorns, right? What I will say is in terms of Samaj Burrell, right? Obviously, it was very reckless for him, one, to be in that position, and two, for him to flee on foot instead of waiting for the police. What I will say is, is this is an underage kid who was drinking and was driving. He hit to Andre Sweat and realized he was going to have to deal with the police. He was going to have to deal with his family. He was going to have to deal with Steve Sarkeesian and the football team. And he also just negatively affected to Andre Sweat's draft status. As an underage kid in that moment, he was reckless for fleeing from the police. But I can also understand why he would have been scared to deal with everything he was about to have to deal with and why he thought he could escape that situation in that moment. To Andre Sweat, you are less than two weeks away from the biggest day of your life, less than two weeks away from validating all the hard work that you put in your entire life. You speak about your mom glowingly every chance you get. You're less than two weeks away from validating everything that your mother did to get you here. And you go out and put yourself behind the wheel of a car while drinking and driving with that much alcohol in your system knowing what could potentially happen. And I've been, you know, a college student before I'm 30. I'm young now. Like I understand it. You were drinking. You were like, I'm a good driver. I drive all the time. I can make it home. And maybe if Samaj Braille didn't hit him in the back, he probably would have made it home. Right. But anything can happen when you put yourself in a reckless situation like that to be driving drunk behind the wheel. You're still, even if you make it home safely, you're still putting other people's lives in danger and you're putting yourself at risk. And now even though this is a situation that these two players can overcome and I hope they overcome and bounce back from, you have negatively affected yourself for the rest of your life because you decided to make a impulse, reckless decision. Tavondre Sweat and Samaj Burrell could have called an Uber that night and I would not be having this conversation on this podcast, but because they decided to not call an Uber or Lyft, because they decided to get in those cars drunk and try to drive home, Samaj Burrell has now been suspended indefinitely from the Texas football team. And all the I mean, all the reporting is that he inevitably will enter the transfer portal when the portal opens back up. But if you're another school or college, are you beating down the door to get Samaj Burrell, who never played at the University of Texas and just fled on foot recently instead of facing the cops for a DWI when he's not even old enough to drink? So because of the decision Samaj Burrell made. He likely will never play football at the University of Texas ever, and he's probably severely limited his options moving forward in the transfer portal. And as far as Tavondre Sweat, I would have to think there's some teams that have taken him off their draft board completely, and I would have to think that if this didn't happen, he would get drafted a lot earlier than he's about to based on him getting you know, pinned for a DWI less than two weeks away from the biggest day of his life. So obviously, Tamandre Sweat will still get drafted. I think he's still going to have a great career in the National Football League, and he can overcome this. And I'm praying that Samaj Burrell, somebody will grab him out of the portal if he decides to go into the portal. And he'll be able to overcome this and be a great football player and achieve everything he wants to achieve. But as of right now, what we know is their decision not to call an Uber that night, their decision to be reckless and drive drunk has cost Samaj Burrell an opportunity to possibly ever play at the University of Texas and has cost Tavondre Sweat financial opportunities, whether that be dropping in the draft or an endorsement company saying, we don't want to endorse somebody who was driving with that much alcohol in their system. We can't trust somebody to endorse our product that was driving with that much alcohol in their system. I'm not judging these players. I'm not acting like I'm better than them or I'm above them because as I've admitted on this podcast, I have drove drunk as well and I am young and I have made mistakes. I've just never had as much to lose as Tamandre Sweat and Samaj Burrell in this situation. But even though we all make mistakes and even though you're young and even though you can overcome this and be better from this, every consequence, excuse me, every action has consequences. And the actions of these two young men recently will affect them for the rest of their lives because Samaj Burrell likely will never play a snap at the University of Texas because what he did over the weekend. 
And so Andre Sweat will likely lose money in endorsement opportunities because of what he did over the weekend. They can come back from it. They can bounce back from it and they can show an opportunity to be resilient. But the best opportunity is to prevent this from happening in the first place and not having to be resilient at all. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.